welcome. Welcome to Come Holy Spirit. This is going to be great. I'm so glad to see you all. I'm Justin, I'm one, of the, one of the pastors here at River Heights Vineyard. And um, we're going to start by singing to the Lord together. So I'm going to welcome you as you're able to stand with me. Jesus, we lift up your name in this place. We thank you for who you are, what you've done for us. Father, for your love. And we do say, Holy Spirit, come. We welcome you, Lord. Lord, would you connect our hearts to those places that long for you? We acknowledge our need before you, and we've come. And you're worthy of all glory and honor and praise, God. And we thank you in advance for the good things that you're going to do, the good things that you've got planned. And friends, we're going to be singing in English and Spanish this evening, so uh, you can expect a lot of that during this conference. It's going to be wonderful. Vengo a adorarte, vengo a cantarte, vengo a decirte que eres mi Dios, Dios poderoso, Dios del descanso. Mientras cantamos, aquí tú estás. God over our stride, God over our sleep, God over our struggle, our work and our rest, God over our future, God over our history, God over our family, our people, our land. God over our stride, God over our sleep, God over our struggle, our work and our rest. God over our future, God over our history, God over our family, our people, our land. Oh, you are the one who sees all our needs. You are the one who provides. You are the peace that our souls receive. En ti podemos descansar. 
in your presence there is comfort in your presence there is power in your presence there is healing pouring out of who you are we are we are thirsty for your presence for like rain for like rain for like rain for like rain we are thirsty we are thirsty for your presence for like rain for like rain for like rain for like How many of you ever dreamt of the time when every knee will bow down and every tongue will confess? God today is giving us a teeny tiny little taste of that. And we honor him because of that. Hoy le damos las gracias al Señor porque con tanto anhelo hemos soñado con el día en que Dios mostrará que cada rodilla se va a doblar y cada lengua va a confesar que Jesús es el Señor. Y hoy nos da el Señor una muestrita así bien pequeñita de lo que eso es. Oh,
song from your heart to the Lord. Sing a love song to the Lord for His faithfulness and His mercy endures forever and His love endures forever. people in the room who've been asking and praying for things this week as we've been preparing. I just want to take a moment and say, be mindful of these things right now. Let's be aware of holding those to the Lord. Let's feel like the Lord's saying He just wants to honor the prayers and the requests of your hearts. God, thank you that that somehow you honor us. We honor you, Lord, and, and then you, you listen and you care. Thank you that, you that you hear. We invite you. We invite you to just take these things that we've been asking. Thank you for your care for us, God. And even right now, maybe just receive the care of the Lord right now. There's the, the presence of, of God is on some of you. I can see that. God, we just receive what you have for us. We bless you, Lord. More, 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 Holy Spirit.
We love you, Lord. We thank you for your, your presence here among us. And you can be seated now for, uh, for now, friends. It's so good to worship together. We'll have chances to do more of that. And here's Pete. He's got some announcements for us. Good evening, Pete. Good evening, Justin. Oh, Marta. Is she? Oh, good. I'm so glad. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Pete. I'm one of the pastors here. Microphone's right over here, Marta. And we are super glad that you are here as well. All the folks from La Vina, all the folks from River Heights Vineyard. We are two languages, one church family. It is awesome to be able to have a conference celebrating together. So welcome. Welcome to your home. Oh, thank you for inviting us to your home. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I get nervous when I have to speak on English. So sorry. Uh, but I'm really happy to be here because we are a part of this wonderful family. And I'm really thankful for that. Um, okay, uh, we have to give you the welcome. And then uh, I want to invite you to please, could you stand just for a little? I need to do an icebreaker with you. And I want to do that with you. So please, could you stand up? Stand up. Okay, we are going to do some exercise. This is like a like a way of do fitness when we are Christian, sit down and stand up, yeah? So I would like to invite you to move this arm and that you can move all your hand, all your, your whole arm. Try not to punch the person next to you. Yeah, please. And then, congratulations for being here in this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Originally, Marta said, I would like to have everybody stand up and give a massage to their neighbor, and I said, white people don't no. do that. That's just not going to work for us. We don't like each other the way you people do. Um, that's not going to work. Uh, okay. Uh, I get to lead us in a prayer for this evening, and so let's just come together before God. So God, we are so grateful that we could be together tonight. It is amazing to be brother and sister with everybody in this room, to be really your family. We are so grateful that, Jesus Christ, you have made this possible for us to be a family. Thank you, thank you, 
Thank you. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and have your way right now for the rest of this conference, for the rest of our lives, today and every day. All God's people said. Amen. Amen. All right, announcements. I got number one, bathroom locations. Every hallway outside these doors has a bathroom in it. And so if you go right or left or forward or around or past the hallway in front of you, you will find a bathroom. Enjoy. Okay. That was going to be my announcement. So now I have to try to... <laughs> okay, so coffee and snacks. Uh, we, we are going to have these in the Welcome Center, so feel free to take whatever you want. Yeah. And then um, we are going to have an, an, a room and a space in La Viña Sanctuary. So if you want to rest a little, or maybe you can eat, you can go to the other side of the building and do whatever you want to do. Yeah. That's right. So the La Viña Sanctuary is hangout space. If you guys want to spend some time with the people you came with afterwards, if it goes really long in here and you just need a break, go hang out in the other space. Uh, we have Wi-Fi. It's the River Heights Vineyard guest. Uh, network, you can go ahead and join that if you'd like to. And uh, we are giving you the opportunity to donate toward making this conference happen. It's gonna wind up costing us a few thousand dollars. If you wanna contribute toward making that happen, you can put gifts in the connection card boxes at the back of the room, or you can give using push pay. Directions to do so are behind us. And on that note, Steve Nicholson, where are you? Fantastic, come on up here, please. Let's give it up for Steve Nicholson. told Steve I would keep the introduction short and sweet. And so, I got to go to Turkey and Azerbaijan with Steve and spend a couple weeks in real close contact every day. And I love and admire and want to be more like this man. He is really smart, he is super down to earth, and he has that amazing gift of when he invites God to do stuff, God does stuff. And that's really the biggest reason that we would have him here today. And so, you know, when you get to follow someone around and see God do all kinds of things, you just want to spend more time with a person through whom God does a whole lot of things. And so, God, we just ask that you would bless Steve, that his time here would be rich for him, that you would speak super clearly and directly, and that through Steve, uh, you would do all the things that you have in mind for your people tonight. Amen. 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 Thanks, you. It's great to be with you again. Uh, I doubt if very many of you brought your Bibles with you, but probably a lot of you have a Bible on your phone. So I want to go to the first chapter of Acts. In verse 4 it says, On one occasion, while Jesus was eating with the disciples, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it's just interesting to me that it says he gave him a command. And the command was, wait. That's always our favorite command, right? Wait. Uh, and he wants them to wait for the Holy Spirit. And, you know, usually we kind of look at that as like they waited once and then the day of Pentecost come and it's done. But what if that was a command for every generation? Hmm? What if that is a command for every church family? Wait for this Holy Spirit to come. You know, that's what we're doing in this time. Like, we're waiting and looking and making ourselves available to him. We're trying to fulfill that command. And, you know, it, it tells us something else. It's not really optional for the church to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus actually intends his church to be supernatural. Filled with the Spirit. Like, that's the supernatural part. The other part is us. That's a pretty mixed bag, isn't it? So, 
you know, you really want the Holy Spirit part of this equation because uh, otherwise, like, what do we got? Like, if the church isn't supernatural, if it isn't occasioned by the reality that God might intervene and do something unexpected, then what do you have? You have a human institution? Stop hurting each other? And maybe a tradition that everybody has forgotten what it was for in the first place? And a bunch of rules, like the Pharisees, that nobody can actually keep. That's what you end up with without the Holy Spirit. So he says, like, don't even try to do the mission. Don't even get started. Tell the Holy Spirit comes. I, I got this quote I got to read to you. Hang on a second. I've got to pull that up. This is from a Greek Orthodox leader. So Ignatius IV, Patriarch of Antioch. Now, just for those of you who aren't acquainted, this would be the Antioch of the Bible, the same place, the same church that you read about in Acts 13. Well, he's the leader of that church now. And this is what he says. Without the Holy Spirit, God is distant. Christ is merely a historical figure. The gospel is a dead letter. The church is merely an organization. Authority is domination. And mission is propaganda. Worship is an evocation. And Christian action is slave labor. But with the Holy Spirit, the risen Christ is here. The gospel is a life-giving force. The church means communion with the Trinity. Authority is a liberating service. Mission is like Pentecost. The liturgy, is, which is basically worship, is both a commemoration and an anticipation. And human action becomes more godlike. I love that. Like that's, that's the deal. And I think in our time, a lot of people are kind of unhappy with the church. And what it boils down to is they're unhappy because what they haven't experienced is the church as a supernatural force inhabited by the Holy Spirit. And so they're just, they're bound to be unhappy. So like it's, it's really important. And the interesting thing then, too, is that Jesus uses this word, you will be baptized. Now, baptism is to be dunked. <laughs> to be under the water, to be surrounded, to be swept away, to be overwhelmed. He's not talking about a toe in the water here. He's not talking about just a little taste. He's talking about being overwhelmed, being filled, being surrounded, being taken to who knows where. Now, that's kind of a problem for us because the subtext of that is you will no longer be in control. Oh, that really gets at, our, gets at us, right? Because we all want to get be in control. You know, if anything this pandemic has done for the world, it's made it clear we are not in control. And we don't like it, do we? <laughs> we don't like it one little bit. <laughs> But Jesus says when, when the Spirit comes, you know, it'll be him and not you. In fact, the apostles take it even further. They say, I no longer live. I'm dead. But Christ lives in me. So we desperately need the Holy Spirit. But when you get involved with the Holy Spirit... 
anything could happen. And you aren't calling the shots anymore. And I, I don't, my feeling is, have you really been that good at it anyway? <laughs> Believe me, I gave it a good try. And it didn't work out that well. God finally brought me to the end of myself where I knew, like, I can't do anything. Like, I really can't do anything. I tried to plant a church, and I couldn't get that church off the ground. So then I tried killing the church, and I couldn't kill the church. <laughs> Either. Some guy named George got saved just the day before I was going to kill the church. And I was so mad <laughs> because... Like, we'd gone for two years, nobody got saved. I was ready to finally cash it in, go back, give it up, be done with this. And then he went and got saved. So now, like, now we got a baby Christian. We got to stay and take care of him. <laughs> and then, you know, the Holy Spirit came and showed me what he could do. Right? That's the deal. We have what we, we can do, and then there's what he can do. Somebody asked me a few years back, have you achieved your dreams for my, your life? And I laughed. And I said, oh, we passed those up so long ago. Like, my dreams just weren't nearly crazy enough or big enough. Because where, my, where, where it's gone, once the Holy Spirit got a hold of me, is beyond my imagination. That's how we end up in places like Azerbaijan and Turkey, like sort of like, golly, like how did I end up doing that, you know? You know, we've ended up getting connected with like hundreds of house churches in Iran. How did that happen? You know, God just like did it one little string at a time, you know? You know how it started, the whole deal, the Turkey, Azerbaijan, Iran, how it started? I used to go up to the Northwestern University when I was younger and could pass for a student. And I would go to the student group in university and sit in the back, figure out who the leaders were, make friends with them and get them coming to my church. And that way I got the whole group. <laughs> so one night I'm up there and I'm sitting in the back and this guy comes in and he's sitting next to me and he's sick as a dog. Like he's got the worst cold you've ever seen. And he's dripping and sweating and coughing. And, and I'm thinking, why did you even come? And then I'm thinking, why are you sitting next to me? This is before we had mass. And for some reason, and this is interesting because it's before I met the vineyard. It wasn't my normal thing to do. But for some reason, instead of like just being annoyed at him, I offered to pray for him. And he said, okay. And so I prayed for him. And he was instantly healed. Like right in front of my eyes. Like it all stopped. All of it. Like he was like a regular person. Like no drip. It's the only cold in 45 years I've ever seen healed. <laughs> Lots of cancers healed, but only one cold. Well, it turned out that guy was a Turkish exchange student. So he comes to Jesus. Then he brings another woman from Turkey, and she comes to Jesus. And then the next thing we know, she's part of a group in Turkey, and they're inviting us to come and help them learn about the Holy Spirit stuff. And boom, it all just went from there, just starting with praying for one person. You know, I was up here this summer, and on the plane on the way home, I thought, I'm going to get my gospel music on. I'm going to get happy. I'm going to be good. And I'm sitting down on this plane. It's one of the small planes, two, two seats on the side. And I sit down, and a guy comes in, sits down next to me, and he turns to me almost immediately. Younger guy, about 40, which is younger to me now. <laughs> and... He turns to me and says, I'm on my way back home after the worst day of my life. Like, that's the first words out of his mouth. And I thought, there goes my gospel music. 
and we talked the whole way home. It was like, I sort of like, how do they know? You know, but God just like, when you put him in charge, stuff happens. So that's the thing. That's what Jesus is looking for um, in his church and in his people. That just, whether it's the conversation you didn't expect, the healing that you didn't expect, the whatever, you know, getting interested in different ministries, the call to serve in a way you didn't expect to serve, whatever it might be, it ends up being supernatural. So this is all really important. And now the interesting thing is that, of course, the, it's not something that started with the vineyard. Like it started back in the first chapter of Acts at the beginning of the church. And the Holy Spirit has been active. There are signs. You can find miracles happening in every century in church history, sometimes more frequently, sometimes less. There's some good times and some not so good times, but the Holy Spirit's never left the church. It's always been there. And then, of course, in 1906, there was a huge outpouring of the Spirit that started through a one-eyed black man named William Seymour in Los Angeles which is now known as the Azusa Street Revival, which launched the whole Pentecostal movement that spread through the whole world. And it's now embracing something like over 500 million people. So, um, you know, something in these sort of more recent times is really happening in a very big way. Sometimes here in North America, we don't realize how big it really is because if you go to Africa or other parts of the world, it's gigantic. Uh, very huge. Um, so that part isn't necessarily new. But what is new with the vineyard is the way we approach it. And I want to take some time just to talk about our particular family legacy of how we live as supernatural people, as a supernatural church, in a way that kind of works for us, that kind of there's certain things about it that are really important for us that are key for the way we do it. And the first thing is, it's all rooted in kingdom ministry and in kingdom theology. So the theology of the kingdom is the idea that there's the age to come when everything is done according to God's will, when there is no more sickness or sorrow or oppression or injustice or diseases or pandemics. There's no more of that. And then there's our current age, which is really messed up. And our age is, you know, the God of this world is the devil. And, and there's all kinds of problems. So there's those two ages. But the prophets promised that one day God would send his champion, his Messiah, and he would invade this dark age that we live in. And he would bring the kingdom of God, the rule of God, back to the earth and start the process of making right everything that's wrong. When he, when he comes, then the lame will walk and the blind will see and the dead will rise and we will start to see the signs of the age to come in our midst. So when Jesus did come, what did he say? Good news, what? The kingdom of God is here. It's the beginning of the invasion, though, not the completion. So all of a sudden, the two ages overlap. And because the kingdom is here, we see all these things of power and miracles and so on and so forth. But because the kingdom is not fully here, because we're in a time of conflict, God is invading this earth and this age to take it back for himself because God's will is not yet fully done on earth as it is in heaven. Not everybody we pray for gets healed and people still get sick and die and so on. All those things still happen at the same time. So it's overlapped, which is really important in several ways. One is it gives us a theology for failure. Like when you pray for people, 
You don't have to blame them if they don't get healed. In the last 35 years, I've probably prayed for 20, 30,000 people myself. Thousands have been healed. Tens of thousands, nothing happened. And it just, it's just because, well, the kingdom, God's will isn't always done, essentially. That's why we pray the Lord's Prayer. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why do we pray that? Because it's not. So we pray that for those reasons. And that gives me a theology for failure. It allows me to get up again the next day and do it again. And I always remind people, just remember, in baseball, you can fail 70% of the time and get paid millions. <laughs> so that's number one. It gives us theology for failure. And two, we understand that the work of the Spirit is about inbreaking more than method. It's the inbreaking of the Spirit of the Kingdom of God into our life. And it's not always expected, and it's not always earned, and it's not a function of what we do. It's inbreaking, not method. Everybody else tries method. If you just do this, then the miracle will happen. If you just do that, then you'll be healed. You know, if, but what is it? It's method. And at the heart of method, is what? The desire to be in control. See, and that's why we say, if you just have enough faith, you can always be healed. Well, we're just trying to grab onto something so we can still be in control and have method. Instead, it's in-breaking. You don't know when it's going to happen. And you just have to go for it every time. I just swing at every pitch because I can't tell which one is going to work <laughs> because I'm not in control. So I just... Keep trying. I just swing at every pitch. You know, uh, <laughs> about five years ago, a couple young pastors came to me and they said, we want to know your secret. We've been talking and we've, we've agreed. Whenever you go places, stuff happens. So we want to know what the secret is. Tell us your method. And I laughed at them. And I said, oh, you don't get it at all. It's nothing that I do. It's nothing. It's what was done to me. Like, I got ambushed by God and cooked on a roaster for three hours. I mean, fire in my body from head to toe. Mostly because he was trying to burn out my fear of what people thought. He really hates that one really doesn't like that one. So, and it took a while. <laughs> it took a while for that, that sucker to die. You know, but after that, stuff started happening. And it wasn't because I did anything. It was because of what was done to me. Again, that's why we're here. So he gets the opportunity to do stuff to us. So that after that, he can do stuff through us to other people because that's how it usually goes. First, as Jesus said when he talked to the disciples, something has to happen to us. But then it happens through us to other people. And that's the ultimate goal. It's not The ultimate goal is not us just getting Jesus jollies every week. Like, like I don't get the fire thing ever again, <laughs> particularly. In fact, a lot of times I don't feel anything. But that doesn't mean the power is not there. You see, it's, it's not about entertainment in that sense. It's, it's about giving. So anyway, it's in-breaking more than method. That's super important. Second thing about the way the vineyard approaches this is that we try to be what we call, you'll hear this phrase, naturally supernatural. That means try not to be any more weird than you have to be when you're doing weird things. Because, I mean, fundamentally, the kingdom of the future, the kingdom of God, is a weird thing in our experience. It's another world. You know, it's, it's something else entirely. Like people getting healed and people shaking and people feeling power and, and miracles happening of all sorts. 
you know, that's weird. But you don't have to, like, make it more weird by, you know, doing extra things, you know, uh, by, by yelling or having a funny vocal tone, you know. Like, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, so some of the people in the Pentecostal church, they couldn't just say Holy Spirit. No, they had to go, Holy Spirit. You know, they had to, like, put a little heebie-jeebie in there. They're adding a little weirdness to it. You know, so we're trying not to do that. We're trying to just, like, be regular people. And you'll see in a minute why that's really important. That's actually, it's not just a pure sort of style thing. There's, it's actually strategic. Um, so we, one of the things that we want to make it naturally supernatural, of course, is we, we try to break down how that all works. We want to we teach people, ordinary people, how to pray for the sick, how to talk to somebody, how to get a word for somebody, how to hear God, all of that, and put it down easy where you can do this at home. That's our goal. So you have to make it naturally supernatural. Because what, our, what we want you to do is when you're listening, think to yourself, I could do that. You know, when I was growing up, I saw some people doing miraculous things, people on stages doing incredible stuff, but I never thought I could do that. My thought was always, I could never do that. <laughs> the way they're doing that, I would never do that because I'm just not that kind of a person. And so we want to make it so that everybody's saying, I could do that. So naturally supernatural. And no hype or no manipulation. Also because when you add extra hype or manipulation, then people start wondering, is this really from God or is it just an emotional effect? You, you can't be sure where it's coming from. You know, back when uh, John Wimber was alive, he would do these big conferences. And I can remember being in England and there was a giant conference, like three, 4,000 people. And there'd been all these reports of previous conferences where so many miracles happened. So everybody's coming just filled with, you know, anticipation. And he would speak, and he always seemed to speak way too long. He would, like, so patiently go through every Bible story and play it all out for us. And we're always like, come on, let's just get to the, to the other part, you know, to the, the other part. So we, he'd finally get done. We'd get there, and the whole room was like, <gasps> and he'd say, let's have a coffee break. He'd like completely bust it. Just like no music, no emotion. Like, let's, just, let's have a coffee break. Everybody comes back. They're full of their coffee. They're flat. The room is flat as a pancake. And then the miracles would start. And, and the thing is, when, that, when it happened like that, nobody can say, oh, it was just emotional hype, just emotionalism. You know where it's coming from. And that's really important, too. So, number three, for us, we understand that the work of God, the works of the Holy Spirit, all their varied ways, come by mercy, not by works. It's by mercy, not by works. It's never about whether anybody deserves it. Let me say that again. It's never about whether anybody deserves it. In fact, he seems to go out of his way to find the most undeserving people to show his mercy. People like us. That's the way, that's the nature of it. It's sort of like, it's all about mercy. So prayer is about how much so-and-so deserves to be healed are actually not just not helpful, they're positively counterproductive. Because you're, you're literally speaking against mercy as if deserving had anything to do with it. And I used to do a lot of that before I got to know how God really wants to work. 
So that means we don't have to talk God into it. We don't have to talk God into it. And it's not dependent on our holiness. It's not even dependent on our health. I can't tell you how many times I've been teaching a class on healing and I've been sick. And everybody got healed except me. Because it's not even about, it's not my health I'm giving to them. It's all about mercy. The mercy of God is what I'm introducing them to. Number four, we in the vineyard are not looking for the next superstar. Okay, there are sometimes superstars, people with so incredible gifting um, that it's, you know, mind-boggling. You know, it's sort of like the musical gifting God gave Mozart. Like when you read about his gifting, you just think it's outrageous that God would give somebody that degree of talent. But he just does. He just... You know, some people end up being superstars, but that's not what we're looking for. Remember what I said? We're looking for people to do this at home. People saying, I could do that. The trouble with the superstars is you may be awed, but you never go home thinking, I could do that. Instead of trying to build superstars, we are trying to build healing communities. We're trying to build healing communities. And we do conferences just for training's sake. We do this kind of stuff just so we can train and encourage each other. But this is not the end. The end of what we're looking for is stuff that's going to happen on a plane, in your kitchen, in your living room, all those kinds of places, with the people you already know. You know, in your cubicle at work, if you still have a cubicle at work. <laughs> I'm not sure how many people have cubicles anymore or even a place to work other than home. But, you know, you, we want you to do it in the course of your ordinary life. Um, and kind of along with that, then, we're not looking for entertainment, but equipping an army of ordinary people. Because if you really want to change the world... There are never going to be enough superstars to do it. You're never going to get your, that member of your family, that neighbor, that coworker to go see Benny Hinn at a big conference or somebody like that. It's never going to happen. But they might just tell you about their troubles in your living room or even better in your kitchen. Give them a little food. Maybe even a little wine. <laughs> then the Holy Spirit takes over. You know, they get softened up. They let their guard down. They start telling you the truth, and you're off and running. You know, um, that's what we're looking for. Healing communities. Um, and that's one of the reasons when you went to a John Wimber meeting, you never saw him praying for people. You know, some of the superstars, they'll, just, they'll pray for everybody, and they end up with long lines of people going out the doors waiting to get prayed for. Not John Wimber. He would not do that. He would, like, get things going and make us pray for each other, <laughs> not him. Um, because he was trying to chain, train an army of ordinary people. And he was ruthless about it over entertainment. Uh, the very first conference that he did in Chicago, so I was like 30 years old at the time, small church. We were like one of the first vineyards in the state of Illinois. And they came to do this big conference. And people came from five states all around. And uh, so he, there was myself and two other guys there that had churches, vineyard churches nearby. And so he came to the three of us and he said, okay, so it's the first night. So I'm going to get three people on the stage that we can pray for at the ministry time, the clinic time. And I want you guys to just pray for them for healing, whatever it is they have, and just show people our non-hype, non-manipulative, low-key, naturally supernatural way of praying for healing. Can you do that? Yeah, we can do that. So we get there, and it's a huge stage almost as big as this room. And so we have 
these three people over on the side, and we pray for them, and we finish, and they go back and sit down. I don't even remember what I prayed for for the person. And so then we're, everybody's waiting, like, what's going to happen next? Because those three people got prayed for, and then they sat down. And then John leaves the podium, comes over to us, and he says, hey, guys, I don't know what to do next. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> and not knowing any better, I piped up and said, well, I kind of thought we ought to pray for people with thus and so condition. I named some physical condition. He said, oh, that's a good idea. Go up to the mic and tell everybody that's what we're going to do now. And I was horrified. Like, I'd never spoken in a mic in front of 3,000 people before or 2,000 people. But, like, I, was, I couldn't figure out how, any way to stay there and have an argument with him about it. So I just had to do it. Like, all right, I'm, uh, go up to the mic. Okay, everybody, we're going to pray for people with this condition. If you have that, stand up and come down to the front. A ministry team will come and pray for you. And so people are coming down. And while they're coming down... He comes up behind me and he says, I'm going to the hotel now. You're in charge of the whole rest of the ministry time. <laughs> and he was gone. <laughs> that evening was not as exciting as people were expecting it to be. Because what was he doing? He was actually literally willing to disappoint the sort of entertainment expectations of 2,000 people just to train one young pastor. Just kind of pushing me over the end, over the edge a little bit, you know. Um, that's, that's the degree to which it's about not entertainment. And, you know, this is a freebie. It's just my personal opinion, but as time goes on, I, I kind of look as the pandemic is in part a judgment on entertainment and consumerism in the church. I, I think, you know, some of the ways that my generation and the Jesus movement developed kind of introduced an entertainment element into the church, and it has not grown into a very pretty thing. Um, it's become almost an idolatrous thing. And I just feel like with the, p the pandemic, it's just like, boom, just brought judgment on that, ended that. So maybe that's a good thing. But certainly uh, for us as a wider movement, a wider family, we have always understood that it's not entertainment that we're looking for. <clears throat> Now then, one of the things that we learned in the vineyard, how are we doing on time today, is that when the Holy Spirit's power is working, we need to understand that it's real power. It's not imaginary power, nor is it emotional force, but it is real power. And, uh, you know, the, the way... The way I discovered it was the very first time I saw John Wember, he gave a little talk to a group of pastors that were in Southern California, and a friend had invited me to come there, and, and uh, he gets to the end of his talk, and he says, uh, everybody stand. And then he says, uh, you can open your eyes or close your eyes. So I thought, well, I'm going to open my eyes. I want to see what's going on. And then he just says, Holy Spirit, come. Like, no songs, no emotion, no stories, no, just Holy Spirit come. And then we're waiting. And we're waiting. And we're waiting. And we're waiting. And I'm starting to think, I knew it. The Holy Spirit's busy somewhere else today. <laughs> and then he points at this guy in the front row and says, see, the Holy Spirit's coming on him. And I'm thinking, what in the world? is he talking about what what does he see like am i supposed to see doves am i supposed to see lights uh what am i looking for um what kind of glasses does he have where do i get them what is he talking about 
And I'm still kind of wondering and pondering this phrase, you know, see the Holy Spirit on me, puts up one finger, touches the guy on the forehead, and the guy starts sobbing. And I go, oh, well. The guy's wife then starts crying. When I figure, well, that figures. She's probably been waiting for him to break down for 10 years. <laughs> and then it all kind of gets quiet again, and we're standing there again, waiting. And we're waiting. And then this lady over in the row behind me, about six chairs over, starts shaking her hands like this. And I'm thinking, boy, she's weird. She's weird. Like, where are the ushers? She's got a problem. You know, somebody needs to help her. You know. You know, and then a few other judgmental things, you know. I knew it. California land of you know, the outlandish, we'll say. And uh, I'm in the middle of doing that, looking at her and judging her, and all of a sudden John Wimber says, now receive the Holy Spirit, kind of forcefully this time. And when he did, it was like a fist hit me right in the middle of my chest, and just about knocked me over. And time slowed down for me for a few minutes there. And I had a first thought, which was, I must regain control of my body immediately so that I don't end up looking like her. <laughs> My second thought was, since when does God hurt people, hit people? Then I remembered Paul on the road to Damascus and thought, oh, it could be worse. I, at least I can still see. <laughs> and I did make a mental note. Whoever said God is a gentleman is an outright liar. And then I thought, wait, hold on, hold on. That was like real. That was like really real. That was like real power. Like this was not some emotional thing. I was busy judging lady shaky hands over here. And it was most certainly not theoretical, like some concept in calculus that I never understood. It's like real. It's like real power. And here's the thing. when Because it's real power, when it touches people, there are side effects. Not always. Not always, but often. Probably maybe 80% of the time. There are side effects of some sort when he's coming in power because it's real power. So people get hot, for example. A lot of times it's experienced as heat, and they get hot, and they start to turn color, or they start to sweat, and their face starts to shine. Or sometimes they start to tremble just a little bit in their legs or their hands. Or sometimes their eyes start fluttering really fast, and the Eyes fluttering is always interesting because when it happens, people try to stop it, and the harder they try to stop it, the worse it gets. Or their breathing changes, or they start slumping over like somebody put a 30-pound weight on top of them. And these are things you can see. It's not because the Holy Spirit's trying to cause those things. He's trying to do something else. He's trying to empower them for ministry. He's trying to heal them. He's trying to set them free. You know, he, those are the big three that the Holy Spirit does. He's trying to show them God's love, which is a major part of what he wants to do with us. But there's side effects because it's real power, and those side effects can sometimes be seen. And when we say, look at the Holy Spirit, what we really mean is, look at the effects of the Holy Spirit on this person. Just like when you look out the window and say, look at the wind, you don't actually see the wind, but you can see the effects of the wind. And if you stand in it, you can feel the, uh, the force of it. And it's the same with the Holy Spirit. So one of the things in the vineyard, and this is really, really important, people. This is super important. We look to follow the Holy Spirit. Because guess what? In ourselves, we can do nothing, right? John 5, 19, Jesus says the son can do nothing of himself. So 
if, if Jesus himself can do nothing of himself, then we can really do nothing of ourselves. So what we want to do is see what God is already doing and bless that. And when we see what God is already doing and bless that, it gets stronger and it has more of a full effect. And it, and it goes somewhere. It's sort of like you put your sail up in the wind and off you go with the Spirit. But you have to see it to follow it. And in order to see it, you have to pray with your eyes open. You have to open your eyes. And you have to watch. Watch their faces. Watch their breathing. Watch their posture. Watch their hands and watch their feet in particular. Because those are the places where most of these things will become apparent. And when you see those things, when you see that the Holy Spirit's starting to move on somebody and they're showing one of those side effects, we then become midwives, helping this person and God continue this connection process so that what God wants to do in them is fully accomplished. Are you following me? We don't make the thing happen, but we help it get born. Just like a midwife doesn't make the baby, but they help that baby get born because they know how the process works, okay? So when we're praying for people, we're not trying to make stuff happen. We're trying to midwife stuff that's already happening. And that changes everything. And the way that we pray is changed by doing that. This is something that I think has often been forgotten in the vineyard and needs to be re rediscovered. Sometimes when you're in a group, like let's say you're in your home group, and you want to pray for somebody who's sick, this is how you want to proceed. You, you want to invite the Holy Spirit to come, and then you want to look around the room you're praying with your eyes open. You look around the room and wait to see who God is putting healing power on for healing of the sick person. Okay, so God's going to show, put, he's going to start pouring power through one person that's going to get connected through them into the sick person. About a few years back, this uh, staff of this really big church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, came to Chicago, and I spent a day with them talking about healing, and at the end, wanted to show them, and they had one of their pastors on the staff had had an athletic accident where he had broken his ankle in some horrible way. He had had numerous surgeries, plates, pins, the whole shebang, trying to fix his ankle, but he was in constant pain anyway. It had never really been restored to normal, and they were now telling him they'd done everything they knew how to do, and he was just going to have to live with this pain. So I thought, let's just pray for him. And so I invited the Holy Spirit to come. Everybody closes their eyes, except me. And I waited, and we're waiting a little bit, and I'm looking around the room. And what I'm looking at, I'm asking God, where's the power? Where's the power? Where's the power? Where is the Spirit working? And as I'm looking around the room, there's one guy, the youth pastor, who's like the sort of the scruffiest looking guy in the room. It looks like he li just got out of living under a bridge. <clears throat> he come, he's there, and his hands are swelling up, and they're turning red. I can see them from clear across the room. They're t swelling up, they're turning red, and there's oil dripping, literally dripping onto the floor. You could hear it going plop, plop onto the floor off the tips of his fingers, and it's sort of like, there is power on those hands. So then I said that out loud. Hey, everybody, look. This guy here, he's got power on his hands. They're all looking now. They open their eyes. And they, see, they finally got, start to see it. And I say, let's get those hands on that ankle and see what happens. So and I said, don't, don't say anything. Just put your hands on the ankle. And then I'll tell you when to say something. So he puts his hand on the ankle, 
that guy's whole leg started shaking violently, like really, really fast for about a oh, good 10 minutes. And he's like talking while this is happening. Like, I can't stop it, guys. I can't stop it. It's, it's like getting stronger. It's like there's this energy in my leg. It's just shaking. I can't stop it. And then, you know, as it's getting really, really strong, I say to the youth pastor, I say, now, I want you to, I want you to say, pain be gone. And he said, okay, pain be gone. And then we said, ankle be restored. Okay, so he does that. After about 20 minutes, but we stopped and checked. The pain was about 80% gone. So we prayed one more time. We did the whole cycle again. And then it was completely gone. And the interesting thing is I visited that church a year later and then two years later. And that guy was still healed. Like he was running and all the pain, was, and pain never returned. He was completely healed. Now, here's the thing. If I had just like, oh, God, please heal this ankle, it's very possible nothing would have happened. The keys were, number one, I invited the Holy Spirit. Number two, I waited. Remember waiting? That's where we started tonight, <laughs> waiting. Two, I waited. Three, I looked for the power. Four, got the power connected. Five, spoke to the condition. That's it. That's, that's how it works. So that's why you need to understand this thing about the physical appearance and look for it. Sometimes when the Spirit comes, he is empowering people for various ministries or releasing in them sp certain spiritual gifts. And that will happen Again, you can see it. So, like, obviously, that whenever the hand thing happens, their hands swell up and turn red and start, that's empowering for healing. That's always going to be about healing, right, whenever you see that. And it happens a lot because a lot of people are sick. <clears throat> and then sometimes you'll get people whose legs start shaking really fast or they'll almost start running in place. That is almost always about evangelism. If you pray for God to use them to share their faith with other people, um, they will run even faster in place. You know, it'll, it'll be really strong on them. Um, sometimes people will get, like, power on their mouth. Their mouth will start shaking, or the, even they'll get, like, a red stripe right straight across their face, right across their mouth. And you can literally, like, the top of their head will be normal, and this part will be, like, red. Like, it's just, like, you can, you can actually see this. And that's empowering for something involving speaking. Usually it's either prophecy or preaching or sometimes teaching, but more often preaching or prophecy. Sometimes a similar thing will happen around their eyes, and that's almost always about dreams and visions. Um... And you can see those things. Sometimes you get power on the top of their head, and but not on their eyes. That's, in my experience, that's mostly about teaching, the teaching gift, which has a lot to do with you know, mental processes. So it's sort of like God empowering different gifts in the people. So then you want to pray that way when you see that happening. Sometimes when the Spirit comes, he causes their bodies to exhibit uh, the thing that's standing in the way. So, <laughs> um, just before the pandemic, I was in Australia and giving a similar kind of talk to them. And so we got to the prayer time and I invited the Holy Spirit to come and this big young guy in the front row falls down in front. He goes down on the knees, then he's down on the floor and then he goes into a fetal position. And whenever that happens, that's almost always like a, a, a strong um, bondage to fear. Fear's got a hold of their, his life in some way. So I told his two buddies, I guess you're going to have to like pray against fear on him because that's fear. 
you know, so you can actually see in the way that his body's reacted what the Holy Spirit wants to set him free from. And when there's something that people need to get set free from, I'm, my experience is the Holy Spirit can't wait to get to it. Like, he will skip a bunch of other issues to get to the freedom thing. You just cannot imagine how much he wants you to be free. He so much wants you to be free. He wants you to be free, free, free. Free to follow Jesus. Free to do live Jesus' way. Free to be who you were made to be. And really hates the things that tie us up and hold us down. So he's very quick to go to us. So you can see things like striving where they start going like this. Or, you know, or anger. You know, so, you know, sometimes you see things and if it just feels like a little like, what is that? You can ask God and he'll tell you what it is. All right. Sometimes when you're praying and the Spirit's working on somebody, um, you'll pray something and it has an, an, a physical impact. Like you see it, like hit them. Like their body will recoil or they'll start crying. You'll see it hit them. Like, oh, that really hit home. Whenever that happens, pray the same thing again. And then again, about three or four times. Because what you want, what you're doing in that moment is your, this, you, that first reaction tells you this is like top priority of what God is doing between this person and him. So you want to stay on there and just kind of keep on that same theme until it really gets deep inside of them fully, whatever that is, when you see that that uh, that kind of response. So you don't just pray one thing. The other thing, too, is that a lot of time in vineyard prayer times, there are no words. It's more like laying on of hands, and sometimes the, the power will come like in a wave. You're like It starts kind of quiet, and it gets more and more intense. And when it gets to the top, then we want to pray at those points, you know, like pain be gone. And then it'll get quiet again. But if you wait just a little bit, sometimes there's a second wave. And, you know, it'll take it deeper. And you want to pray it again at the top of the wave. So we, we're trying to, like, get a sense by listening to God and by watching what is God doing with this person and praying those things at the top of the waves so that it can have maximum effect. All right. Let's take a few time for questions questions. Can I get the house lights up and the spotlights off so I can see people? Like, you know, put the spotlights on you guys and off of me. That would make me a lot happier. Okay, the spotlights are still on. How do we get them off? You don't know. Does Justin know? There we go. Okay. There we go. Ah, so much better. All right, questions. Anybody got questions? Right there. Sometimes I'll ask people to close their eyes if I'm praying for them. Mostly I ask them to close their eyes so they don't get distracted. And so they'll stay engaged with God. The question was... You know, is it awkward if somebody has their eyes open when you're praying for them? So I'm walking. Yeah, that can be awkward. Usually it's non-believers that do that. When I pray for non-believers, they'll look back at me. I think because they want to make sure that, you know, I'm not trying to do something to them. Of course, they're dead wrong. I am trying to do something to them. But, uh, you know, what for... For them, it, I'll kind of, I'll just let them look at me. I'll just go ahead. It won't matter. But, you know, for believers, I'll encourage them, like, close your eyes. Try to engage with God. Don't pray, though. I won't let them pray. Because when we pray, we're giving. You understand? And I, at that moment, I want, I want to be praying, and I want them to be receiving. You, you know, that's part of the midwifing, helping them be in a receiving mode. So 
and I'll have them like close their eyes to help them receive sometimes also. That was a good question. Oh, and we got mics now for the questions. Yeah, um, I'm just kind of curious when people are healed from things, is, it, is there any sort of relationship or percentage where it's actually like demon possession and people have these afflictions like you know people in the Bible or is there a lot of it t sometimes just our own choices and our, you know what I mean? Like, is there some connection or is it mostly our choices or is it 10%, <laughs> you know, <laughs> demon possession or demon, you know, whatever it is? I, I don't know. Okay. Do you understand the question? Yeah, I understand the question. Okay. <laughs> so most things, you know, gravity is a sufficient cause for broken ankles. Um, there are such things as germs, unfortunately. <laughs> germs and viruses, and they cause plenty of trouble. Um, and sometimes our own unhealthy habits make us sick as well. Remember, it's all mercy, not deserving, though. So just even if you've, like, had a bad habit that made you sick, that doesn't mean you can't be healed. Because it's mercy, people. It's mercy. All right? How much of it is demonic? You know something is demonic? Well, let me just put it this way. Sometimes There are demons that like to cause sickness, and they attack people. And it's usually experienced more like something attacking you from the outside, not from the inside. And you can tell when it's a demon because you, they'll say, oh, my shoulder hurts. And so you start praying on their shoulder. You put your hand there. You start to pray on the shoulder. Oh, the pain is in my knee now. So then you go and you pray on the knee. Oh, the pain is in my ribs now. It's like starts moving around their body. Okay. So when that starts happening, you know, this is not like an organic physical thing. This is like a spiritual thing. And the, it's like outs, on the, outside their body. It's like moving around to get away from your hand. Because they're afraid of us. You do understand that, right? They're afraid of us. Like, we are trouble for them. Okay, so... Then I just tell him, you know, sick demon, get out of here. Go bother somebody else. And how much does that happen? Uh, 5% or less. Fortunately. Oh, where's what? Where's my home church? My home church is in Chicago. Yeah, we didn't get that in the intro. I'm from Chicago, by the way. Not that far from you guys. At least, you know, in distance. And generally, you know, Minneapolis, Chicago, similar in many other ways. I actually went to college here in Minnesota. Did you guys know that? Just down the road, Northfield, Minnesota, Carleton College. That's where I, back in the day, that's where I was. Okay, next question. So talk about uh, when uh, you're praying for somebody and there's uh, you get a word of knowledge or a prophecy or a vision for them. What, what's, what, what do you suggest? Okay, so if I'm praying for somebody and um, the Spirit's moving on them and I get, some, I get some additional information from the God side, you know, not what I'm seeing, but more like a prophecy if it's related to what I'm already praying for, I'll just pray it like a prayer. I'll just say it like a prayer um, while we're at it. If it's a completely different direction, I might stop and ask, ask them, depending on the nature of it, is such and such a problem? You know, I'm feeling led to pray this way. Do you... Is that something you agree with? Because you want them, you want, if you're going to change directions, they need to move with you. Because remember our midwifing, this connection. So if I'm going to change direction, I got to make sure that they make the turn with me so that I don't, because I can't like just go off in this direction and leave them thinking, wait, I came up here for this other thing. And now we're praying for this. You understand what I'm saying? 
So you just you just say, ask, say a few things or ask a couple of questions so that they can kind of go with you or say, no, I don't really want to do that. Because you have to stay on the same page. Good question. Another one? Okay, um, I'm learning that we get to, um, or we can, with the right intention, because God would know anyways, ask for gifts, um, because, I mean, there's so many reasons you might ask, but m mostly that you feel God closer to you, and also that you would be an instrument of, um, for him. So is, my question is, is it okay to ask for gifts? Oh yeah, we, it's okay to ask for gifts. In fact, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 tells us to ask for gifts. Seek earnestly the greater gifts, it says. So why do we seek the greater gifts? So we can benefit other people. What makes a great church is when everybody is contributing their gift. That includes gifts that we might think of as ordinary as well as supernatural. So I would just remind you that some of the greatest heroes of the Bible were people who had an extraordinary administrative gifting. Daniel, Joseph, both had the same thing. Also coupled with dreams and visions and interpretation of dreams, but they were extraordinary administrators, both of them. Um, so, you know, the world never has enough administrators. <laughs> so if, if you're an administrator, there is a place for you on the team. Peter will take your name afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean... And there's so many gifts. There's all different kinds of gifts that people have. Um, everybody has a part to play. That's the thing. Everybody has a part to play. And if you, if you have a part to play or something to contribute and you're not, well, you're kind of cheating the rest of us. You're robbing us. Um, and you're robbing yourself of the benefit of being a part of this wonderful thing that is our family. So, yes, ask for the greater gifts. It doesn't mean he always answers yes, you know, because it's still up to his discretion. Also, just because you don't have a gift right now doesn't say anything about a month from now. You know, if you have the Holy Spirit in your life, in a sense, at a low level, you have all the gifts because the Spirit is in you. So we all do a little pastoring just by our call to love one another. And we all do a little evangelism just by being honest with people and sharing with our faith with people that we meet or that we know. And we all do a little prophecy because we can all hear God for ourselves. Do you follow what I'm saying? We all have some of all, all the gifts, but when we say somebody especially has this gift, it just means they got more of that particular thing. So everybody has a part to play. All right, another question. We have one online. You want to take one from online? There's an online question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, okay, yeah. so here's an online question. Do you think that when someone is prayed for and not healed, it means they have a lack of faith or that they, uh, that they are meant to be uh, burdened with illness for God's purpose or that you aren't asking properly for the healing or something else? No. <laughs> None of the above. Absolutely not. Like, definitely not. You know, if somebody has enough faith to ask me to pray for them, that's enough. Okay, that's enough. And, you know, uh, I think, you know, this is where our theology of the kingdom is so important. It's, it's just, if somebody doesn't get healed, I chalk it up to, well, today was one of those days where God's will wasn't done. You know, but God's will will be done eventually. And it might be tomorrow. 
you know, it might be the next life, but it might be tomorrow or the next day. So we just have to keep trying. Next. How will you know that you have a gift? Like, how can you find out? And like, how can you find out what your gift is? Yeah. Ask your friends to tell you what they what it is. <laughs> Generally, your friends know. They know what what God how God is working through you. So that's a good way to start. Ask your friends, and if that doesn't work. God has pe people with a prophetic gift who will all come by and start telling you the same thing over and over and over and over again until you finally give in and do it. See, the problem is self-doubt. Yeah, self-doubt. We think what we're hearing from God is too big for us. And so we question our gift because we feel it's here and we're down here. And this is what I want to say to you. In the end, it's not about you. And it's not about your strength or your goodness or your or what you brought into it. I fought with God for 5 years because he was telling me something too big. And I said, you got the wrong person. I can't do that. Can't you see what a failure I am? You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And he finally put me in a corner where I had to just say yes. And when I finally gave up and just started saying, okay, yes. I don't know how, but it's going to be your problem. Because it's about how big my God is, not how big I am. That's when things started happening. So I want to encourage you to say Yes, and no, and stop doubting yourself. That was good. There was a little Holy Spirit in that one. Yes, there was. <laughs> That's why it was good. <laughs> okay, next. Okay, speaking of self doubt, I'm going to be transparent uh, to something I struggle with. And so I'm wondering if you're in a position where you think you're connected with the Holy Spirit, but you're not really sure, how can you be sure that that's what it is? Or if you're on the receiving end of a prayer and you're doubting what the person is praying about, how can you be sure? Okay, those are two different questions. So if you think you've got something and you're not sure it's the Holy Spirit, what should you do? That was your first question, right? There's only one way to know for sure. Try it. And you, when you try it, you will find out. Because Jesus says, it's by the fruits that you can tell. Not by how it feels up front. Not by the certainty you feel up front. It's by the fruit at the back end. So you just have to try. And he likes people who try. So on that question, I just say, like, just, just give it a go. You know, like, not major decisions like don't quit your job because you think you got a word you know yeah i mean you know major decisions need a thing called confirmation <laughs> all right but if it's just like should i pray for this person should i pray this way you know should i share this word with this person like just have a go just have a go you'll find out that it's more god than you thought Almost always, that's the way it works. It's a lot more God than you thought. Because he's busy. He's busy God. And the other part of your question was, what do you do when somebody's praying for you and you think they're going the wrong direction? So maybe not the wrong direction, but are they truly connected to the Holy Spirit or are they just saying, saying a prayer that feels good to them to say to you? Does that make sense? You know, you know, inevitably, of course, in our family, people are learning. Right? I mean, that's, the, that's why we're here. Inevitably, people are learning. In the process of learning and people just trying, some people are going to sometimes say nice things that are just nice things, but they don't really have any power from God in it. And we can be very tolerant of that. Just, you know, just say thank you. 
That was nice. And if it's God, you won't be able to say that anyway because you'll probably be on the floor or sobbing or something else. But it's okay. It's all right. Like, it has to be a safe place for people to try here. Right? Don't you agree? Yeah. And they're not, when people, when we, if we're saying nice things, like, I mean, the world could use a lot more people saying nice things. So, like, let's not, <laughs> let's let it go. Let's just, let's appreciate that for what it is. And just know that with practice, we'll get better. All right, let's shift gears then, and let's try a little bit ourselves. Are you up for that? Okay. So everybody, let's all stand. Uh, put your stuff down. The coffee you might want to put in a safer place. Yeah, I would suggest. Uh, <laughs> Some people apparently already did. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm going to invite the spirit to come, and then we're going to wait. And what's going to happen while we're waiting, as, as I see the spirit start to move on people, I'm going to call, the, call it out. I'm going to say, I see the spirit on so-and-so, spirit on so-and-so. And as I do that, I'm going to want the people around that person to turn and pray for them. You know, if you're close. And our, my goal is, by the end of the evening, about half of you get prayed for, and about half of you are praying for the other half. Is, is that fair? Because, so, you know, it's, some, sometimes some people really need something right now, and some of us don't really need something right now. But he knows best, and we'll just we'll take it that way. Is that fair enough? And we're, don't worry about your reactions compared to somebody else's, because we're... All individuals, our bodies are wired just a little different. So we have different kinds of side effects a little bit along the way. So don't worry about that, okay? And if you, I'm going to ask you to be in a receiving mode. That means no praying, but only receiving. If you have to just say something, yes, Lord, you can say that. That's allowed. Yes, Lord. But that's it. Nothing else. No, please, God, I'll do this if you touch me. I'll do this if you don't. None of that. No praying. Okay. Holy Spirit, I ask you now to come and empower your people to be a supernatural church. There is this row, this second row, this section, starting with the tall guy on the end, going all the way to the other end. That entire row, the Spirit's resting on them. So let's get this row in the front. You guys just turn around and start praying for those people behind you. Holy Spirit, just come. The Holy Spirit's coming on them. They need a little help if somebody wants to join them. We don't have anybody, anybody on this end. Let's get you. Yeah. Now it starts off kind of quiet. But the Lord's moving on them. Okay. The young guy in the green shirt, Peter's son. Holy Spirit's on him. Yeah. 